Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Discriminating Gamer. You know, a lot of people ask me if I was named after my father. Well, I certainly wasn't named before him. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at Rommel in the Desert from Columbia Games. We'll get back to the review in just a moment. I want to take a minute to ask you to check out my other channel, that is Cody Carlson PhD, where we talk about history, books on history, military history. I even post some of my uh, lectures for my classes on there. Please check that out. Please subscribe to that channel. And now, back to the review. In Rommel in the Desert from Columbia Games, two players take on the roles of either the British uh, army as it is fighting out of Egypt and trying to defend its positions in Libya, or the Axis player who is playing both the Italian units and the Germans under Erwin Rommel. Erwin Rommel. Now, like many of Columbia's games, this is a block war game in which you have the different kinds of blocks that represent different units. You have, of course, armored units, you have mechanized infantry, motorized infantry, you have recon units, you have artillery, you have anti-tank guns, all sorts of various blocks, and of course they're represented by the steps. You have different steps in which you're going to turn them in order to uh, defeat them in battle. Now the blocks are placed facing the player, so there is a fog of war element where the other player doesn't know exactly what they're going to face, uh, what kinds of units, and on what strength they will be up against uh, necessarily when they're moving around the board. Now, there are a few different scenarios you can play. For instance, you can play a 1940 scenario just between the British and Italian units. You can play a 1941. You can play a bigger campaign over 41, 42. There's different, different uh, like I say, different scenarios, different missions that you can do on this game. But essentially, uh, the map is a map of North Africa. And on the far side, you have uh, the British base at Alexandria. And then on the far left, you have a, a, an Axis base in Libya. Now, in many ways, it's a typical kind of hex-based war game. You have terrain. You also have uh, certain features like roads, which can give you a, a movement boost. You've got trails and tracks and all these things. Like I say, depending on how you use them, they're going to give you movement boosts throughout the board. Each unit you have kind of has its own movement uh, speed, and it also has kind of uh, up in the top left a number saying when exactly it's going to come into the game or if it's a starting unit. Now, all things being equal, you're going to play out the game in a number of steps. Now, the first thing you have is kind of the build-up step. Now, all things being equal, every round, what you will do is you will go ahead and um, advance the track marker. Then you're going to check and make sure that all of your units are in supply. They can trace a, lie, uh, a supply line back to their supply bases. Then you're going to go ahead and check for um, your BP points, your build points, essentially. Now, what you're going to do here is you're each going to roll two die. Now, you're going to add the, the, the total of these four die together, essentially, and uh, that will be the total build points that each player will have. Now, some factors may come into play where you need to see who rolled higher or lower, but generally, you're going to add those numbers together. Now, what you can do then is you can rotate your steps that have been, you know, uh, diminished, you can re rotate them back up to, you know, give them more strength points, uh, depending on the uh, BP uh, point track that you've got. It says exactly how many that will take to do it. You'll also have some other options with your build points as well. Now, at this time, you'll also check for reinforcements. Uh, different reinforcements, as I say, they'll have that number on them, which will say exactly what month they come in during the scenario. You'll go ahead and place those units in your base. Now, you'll also have resupply. Now, essentially, uh, depending on the scenario and depending on kind of 
you know, what uh, what fortresses you have and whatnot, you'll each be getting a number of uh, cards. You'll go ahead and the, the first player who's going through their sequence first, they'll draw all of their cards. And then the second player, they'll go through their sequence, draw their cards as well. Now, at the beginning of the turn, players are going to look at their units that are in supply, and they're going to go ahead and they're going to make decisions about how they're going to play them. Now, what you can do is you can actually play uh, cards, and you play cards in order to supply your units and help them to move. Now, you're going to have a number of, you're going to get a number of these cards, and some of them will have supply. These are kind of like the, the circle that's half filled in. Some of them, however, are empty circles, which means they're more for bluffing and to kind of keep your enemy uh, kind of on their guard about exactly what your intentions are. But you can lay a card down with supply to in order to um, move a unit, uh, a stack of units rather, from one hex to another, provided they are following the lowest uh, speed, speed, uh, the speed of the lowest unit uh, as they are moving forward. Uh, then two, uh, you know, you can put down two or three cards in order to move multiple groups here. You can also do an assault phase where all of these maneuvers are going to end, of course, in an attack. And if you do the assault phase, then all of your units are going to fire twice instead of just firing once. But that's not just your units, that's the enemy, so that's a much bigger battle. Now, after you've moved your units into position and are engaging a battle, you essentially then take your units from the, uh, from the hex that they're fighting in. You place your uh, battle marker there to show uh, where, you, where the battle is. And you essentially lay your units down. Of course, the, the uh, current step is facing your opponent. It's uh, on the top, as you can see it and you are rolling off. But as you are rolling die, the defender's gonna roll first. If they're in a fortress, I think they get a, they get a double roll. Um, but as you are rolling, units have to consult a, a table. So essentially, you have to fire at the other units in your class. Armor has to fire on other armor units. Infantry has to fire on other infantry units, etc., etc. And you kind of have to keep doing that until there are no more units of your class there, then you can start targeting other units. But what you're doing is you're rolling, you're consulting this chart. Typically, all things being equal, if you're firing on a similar class unit, you got to roll a six to get a hit. But um, there may be instances where you could roll a five or a six, or in uh, some cases, as I'll mention, even a four, five, or a six. But you go ahead and you resolve all the steps. Once you go through a round of combat, you replace your guys on the board, unless you do the assault combat, and once you do it twice, uh, and then you kind of proceed. Now, so you have you can have multiple units in the same Hex, this represents battles that are going on for weeks or months at a time. Now, once you played your cards, you're doing a basic offensive assault movement or a blitz, which allows you to, do, to, to move twice like that. Once you do all those things, then uh, it is now your neighbor's turn, your, your opponent's turn, and they go ahead and they can play cards. Now, you can pass at any time. If you pass and your neighbor goes, it comes back to you and you can go again. Uh, pass does not permanently end you from the round. But once both sides decide they no longer can or want to uh, take any actions, then you go ahead and proceed to the next month. Now, if ever a unit is engaged in a hex with another, uh, with some other enemy blocks, they can go ahead and leave. They can choose to leave. But if they withdraw from that hex, if they withdraw from an enemy for, enemy for any reason, the enemy that remains gets kind of an optional pursuit fire roll. Now, optional is probably not the right word. They get a pursuit fire roll. You can't, you know, you can't have slow moving infantry try to attack a fast tank. If they want to take a parting shot, they have to have a comparable uh, speed unit they're going to fire upon. So you go ahead and in this case, you can roll a four, five, or six to inflict damage on those retreating units. Now, of course, as I say, there are fortresses. Players are going to try to take these fortresses. They're going to try to cut them off from supply, which will limit the number of BP units that they can do. Um, but you're trying to maneuver. You're trying to take out these key areas and not take too much damage doing it. So players go back and forth. They are getting cards. They are checking supply. They are moving their units along the roads and the tracks. They are moving, maneuvering themselves into position. They are doing these attacks. They're doing assaults. And they are engaging in combat. Now, there are different kinds of victory uh, conditions in this game, depending on what you're playing for and what you're trying to achieve. And if you can go ahead and achieve those conditions, then you win! Rommel in the desert. So that was a very bare-bones overview. There is a lot more going in this game. This is a, this is a fairly dense game for what it is. And I, I, I don't want that to scare people, because it's, it's, it's a dense game, but a lot of the rules are fairly intuitive, particularly if you have played previous block war games from Columbia Games.
Now, this game had been around since, I think, the early 80s, and this is a new edition of that game. And the game itself is actually um, pretty interesting. It gives you some different uh, different and, and difficult choices um, for how you want to move, how, you know, what do you want to do on your turn. And sometimes you can't do much. Sometimes you're going to get a lot of those dummy cards that really aren't helpful. Um, but, of course, they can, they can, you can hold them back so that your, your enemy may think, well, I can go in and I can expend a lot of stuff, but what, is, what are they going to do? And so it kind of leads to some interesting bluff and double bluff there. But, but, but fundamentally, the game is about maneuver and deciding when and how you want to engage in combat. And sometimes you just need to kind of, you know, just fortune favors the bold and just go at it. And other times you want to be a little bit more sneaky, but you got to be careful, particularly if you're trying to get around your enemy, because, of course, if you get around your enemy, uh, if you're in your enemy's rear, your enemy is in your rear, and that can play havoc with your supply line. So that's, that's something you really have to pay attention to. Um, but overall, the game uh, mechanically is pretty well done. I, I, I actually really like the, um, the the matrix for combat there, where you're firing at the different classes. And depending on the classes you're firing at, you get you, know, you may get no advantage or you may get a lot of advantage. Because like I say, all things being equal, if you're infantry firing on infantry, you've you got to be rolling a six. If you're armor rolling on armor, you got to roll a six. So it's very difficult. So you're spending a lot of time trying to get those sixes that are just not coming. Because, of course, it's, it's die combat. There's a lot of chance here. Um, so that is, that is fun, and it is frustrating. I think it's frustrating in a good way, um, because it's a game that uh, really forces you to, again, try to pick your battles and try to pick your moments and try to, try to work things that are as advantageous to you as you can make them. You know, part of victory here is to whittling down your enemy, destroying your enemy. If you have more enemy units on the board at the end of the game than your than your enemy does, that can lead to a victory. So that's something you're looking at. But capturing the fortresses is important as well. Um, all told, it's a, it's a pretty solid war game. It's a good World War II game, and it's a it's a um, one that that has a level of complexity to it that you do need to invest in it and really read the rules and get into it. But at the same time, it is not so complex that it's off-putting or that it, it, it feels like it's getting into minutia here. Really enjoyed Rommel in the Desert. I think it's a great war game, and if you are a fan of these kinds of games, uh, I, I highly recommend it. Recommendation for the Discriminating Gamer for Rommel in the Desert is... Bye. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on uh, YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We'd ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. I'd ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to please, please, please check out my other channel. That is Cody Carlson, PhD, where we talk about military history and books on history. I post some of my lectures there. I'm currently work, uh, posting lectures on my course on World War II. Please check that out. Please subscribe to that channel. That would mean a lot to me. And also, we'll post this video on Board Game Geek. Please give a thumb uh, to that video there as well. We really appreciate it. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to ask you a question. What does the French groundhog see on February 2nd? His chateau. Rommel.